welcome everyone to the session of today and uh, we praise the Lord for giving us uh, a Sabbath to be able to share in the Word of God and be able to delight together in the blessings that the Lord uh, uh, is giving unto us. I presume that uh, you have been doing well and uh, we want to ask the Lord's blessings as even we uh, start uh, this series of uh, Minneapolis 1888 and uh, praying that uh, the Lord will reveal to us his will and uh, what we are supposed to do at such a time as this. Shall we uh, pray wherever we are as we begin uh, the session? Loving Father in heaven, thank you for your grace and thank you for your presence. We want to walk in thy will and uh, how we pray that we may be led by heavenly agents, that uh, the angels may be in our midst, thy Holy Spirit may, Lord, embrace our minds with truth and uh, uh, active truth in our lives, that uh, we may execute your will at such a time as this. Bless us as we go through this session. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Um, one of uh, the most uh, interest, interesting topics to deal with is uh, the, the issue of righteousness by faith and uh, directly connected to Minneapolis 1888 and the things that were happening at that time. And uh, I know we have gone through the series uh, of uh, righteousness by faith in the past with uh, Brother Eric Cage and myself and uh, our brethren in the ministry also. I uh, have been able to talk about these issues and uh, it won't be a harm again relooking into the issues of Minneapolis 1888 and the history surrounding it and that is why I have decided to run this series it may be five or six presentations on uh, the history uh, its diagnosis and analysis and diagnosis and solution hoping that uh, somebody will be blessed by the session. And uh, because uh, maybe we were not there in 1888, we will borrow uh, heavily on the history of uh, the prophetess uh, E.G. White uh, as we look into this issue and be able to see, are we bound to repeat the same history? Are we repeating it or uh, what the Lord is speaking uh, unto us. And so I won't waste much of the time. Uh, I'll go straight away to uh, the issue at hand. Uh, 1888, it is diagnosis, analysis, and solution. Uh, behind the wheels of uh, 1888, we find E.T. Jones, Ellen G. White, and uh, E.J. Wagoner. Ellen White endorsed the message these two men brought to the general conference session in 1888 about the kingdom and the righteousness of Christ. This message about the fourth angel that joins the third angel at the right time to give him power and force was uh, rejected, ridiculed, and made fun of by the leadership of the Laodicean church at, uh, 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 at that uh, time. And uh, looking at the message itself and what uh, uh, it had. Uh, we read in TM 91.2, this message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of uh, the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that uh, he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. That is testimony um, to ministers and gospel workers, page 91, paragraph uh, 2. And so uh, from the onset, you find that uh, 
Christ had to have eminence in the lives of the people and in some other quotes, we'll find that they had preached the law until they were as dry as uh, Mount uh, Gilboa, the hills of Gilboa. Now, this invited the people to receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which is manifested in obedience to all his commandments. This is the message of righteousness by faith that has to go uh, to the world with a loud voice. But before I continue with the history, uh, I'd like to point out something uh, uh, in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 1. The book of Romans, chapter 1. And uh, I, I read from verses 1 to verses 4 in your hearing, and uh, God permitting to put it where you can see it. It says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. This is the most important thing that uh, we can ever read in the Bible, the gospel of God. He says that he's a servant of Jesus Christ, but what he's just about to present is the gospel of God. And so whatever you are going to read about the gospel, it is the gospel of God, and people are the servants of Jesus Christ. So this is a revelation of God himself manifested in his son, which he had promised for by his prophets in the Holy Scripture. So this gospel of God, it is a promise to the people of God by his prophets. And what is it about? What is this gospel of God that uh, was promised for? Uh, and proclaimed by the prophet. It is concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. This is what we call the gospel. Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. This is the gospel that Paul, as the servant of God, was separated to preach. This is the gospel of God and it concerns his son Jesus Christ. And that is why the gospel, the issue of uh, 1888 was centered upon the people looking unto Jesus Christ for uh, uh, the power to be able to be obedient to God. And uh, he declared to be the son of God with the power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. This is the gospel that uh, Paul is talking about the gospel of God concerning his son, uh, which was declared uh, uh, the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, which means that the death could not hold him down because of holiness. And um, that is the greatest issue that uh, is facing humanity. Humanity coming into the place that death cannot hold them down uh, because of the spirit of holiness. And how can people possess that spirit of holiness? It is through Jesus Christ uh, who Paul actually says that um, uh, he, which he was made uh, of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now this term, the seed uh, of David according to the flesh, is uh, where the power of victory lies therein, which means that uh, Christ as a human being, like we are, uh, uh, was able by the spirit of holiness, according to Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14, to overcome sin in this flesh that we are having and then resurrect from the dead. Death could not hold him down. And uh, the same way he overcame Revelation, we are told that we must overcome and then we shall sit uh, um, uh, with the Lamb uh, uh, on the Father's throne. And so this is the message that uh, was to be made prominent. This was the message to be brought before the people that humanity in the sinful nature can be able, with the help of uh, the spirit of holiness, be able to live uh, holy unto God. Look at the book of Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 and uh, we are told that repetition makes impression. As these things are repeated, they make impression upon those who are listening. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. We are looking at 1888. It is diagnosis, analysis, and solution. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit, that spirit of holiness, 
offered himself without spot. So by the help of the eternal spirit, that spirit of holiness, Christ was able to offer himself without spot, and that can purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And Paul says that uh, this is the gospel of God concerning Jesus Christ, and uh, he had to be lifted, uplifted before uh, the people uh, in, uh, in his fullness of divinity. And uh, again, we are told that uh, this gospel of God uh, in uh, Romans chapter 1, just backing up in Romans chapter 1, verses um, uh, 16, Paul now turns to something so special. After saying that this gospel of God is concerning Jesus Christ, he goes ahead and tells us these important words, that uh, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And this is the message of 1888 which we are looking at. This is the gospel that was to be brought prominent before the people. That Christ never came to do his will, but the will of um, uh, the Father. And this uh, we can uh, read in uh, Philippians, I presume Philippians chapter 3 verses 9, that... Um, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the word, the righteousness, which is of God by faith. And so when we are talking about righteousness by faith, when we are looking at the theme of justification by faith, the third angel's message in verity, what actually we are talking about is the righteousness of God revealed in his son, Jesus Christ. And by possessing His, uh, the spirit of his son, the spirit of holiness, that eternal spirit, we are able to um, uh, manifest uh, uh, the righteousness of God himself. We are, we are placed in heavenly places with uh, uh, our big brother, Jesus Christ, and uh, having the righteousness of God, which is a ticket to heaven, and man cannot manufacture it. It is given without uh, any want of human devising. It's a loom woven in heaven uh, um, uh, by God himself and given to the sons of God through accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord. And so as you look at the issues of Minneapolis 1888, it is not only... A rejection of Jesus Christ himself but it's a rejection of receiving the righteousness uh, uh, of God uh, by people in their life and this is the great issue that we are looking at and we are told that this message has to bring righteousness in our lives now Paul says that um, uh, 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 the just shall live by faith justification by faith which is the third angels message in verity and um, when uh, you look at the third angels message uh, it invites us to receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But how does this come about? We are told that uh, in Matthew 24, 14, that the gospel of this kingdom shall be preached as a witness, and then the end shall come. So this gospel of God, which is the gospel of Christ also, the righteousness of God, has to be preached uh, uh, as a witness, as a testimony. You can see that in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. This message has to go forth with the power, and then the end shall come. It is the last message to be preached to the world. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, the gospel of the kingdom. And we ask ourselves, if Matthew chapter 24, verse 14 is the gospel that has to be preached, and then the end comes, uh, 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 is it different from the three angels messages we find that it is the third angels message uh, in verity so the same message that is preached as the third angels message is the same gospel that is preached as uh, uh, it is indicated in the book of Matthew chapter 24 verse uh, 14 continuing with uh, this history uh, we are told this notice what the people had to be pointed to directed to his divine person. This is the reason why we're going to spend the first five chapters of righteousness by faith, introducing who Jesus was, then delve deeply uh, in the issue of righteousness by faith. That is why E.G. copied his statement. And uh, we find that uh, 
Therefore, God gave his, to his servants a testimony that presented the truth as it is in Jesus, which is the third angel's message in clear, distinct lines. John's words are to be sounded by God's people that all may discern the light and walk in the light. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifies, and no man conceiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath said to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 93, paragraph 1. There is something I want to highlight in this quote, that uh, he that received, he that hath received his testimony hath said to his seal that God is true. So, uh, basically, a rejection of uh, the 1888 message and uh, um, the subsequent sermons by E.G. White and the rejection of uh, the message of righteousness by uh, faith is a rejection that God is true. Now, I'd like us to think about that for a moment because we dwell so much on the issue of Jesus Christ in this message of uh, righteousness by faith and justification by faith. But come to a point, we don't think that um, we are doing a disfavor or making God a liar if we do not believe in the message of righteousness by faith or if it is not manifested. When I say believe, uh, what I basically mean is uh, the manifestation of the message in our life practically and not theoretically. Uh, and that is what uh, God wants us to see. Because we are told, um, uh, and uh, I'll find a verse, um, where we are created uh, sorry This is um, the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 10. This is we, what we read. We, we, when you are talking about the message, believing in the message of righteousness by faith, we are not uh, basically talking about, or we are not talking about uh, just believing in the theoretical part of the message, but uh, exhibiting it practically in our life. And that is what will prove that God is true. Just believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and uh, we are made righteous by the righteousness of, Christ, of God which is in Christ, that is not the message we are being called to believe in. We are called to believe in a way that uh, uh, we will experientially be able to manifest the same message. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So as you look uh, at the message so closely, the message of 1888 and uh, the issue of righteousness by faith, it really falls back to God the Father. The Son has to come and demonstrate that and assure humanity that this is something which is possible and man created unto good works to walk in them by God in Christ has to experientially manifest uh, the same uh, thing that uh, we are talking about that uh, in our lives we have to manifest the righteousness of God and um, what is this uh, issue of being pointed to Christ and being able to reproduce the works of God uh, John chapter 17, uh, just looking uh, uh, at the surface, John chapter 17, verses uh, 1 uh, onwards, this is um, what we see. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is 
life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. People had to be pointed to Jesus Christ, his divine person, and being the seed of David. Don't forget that the gospel is about Jesus Christ being the seed of David. That is the most important thing. And uh, divinity, we are told, divinity combined hum with humanity does not sin. And so, looking unto Jesus Christ, who have that eternal spirit, and giving the same unto us, uh, will be able to uh, uh, impart faith in us. Not only impart, impute, but impart faith in us. There is the issue of um, imparted righteousness, uh, imputed righteousness, and imparted uh, uh, righteousness, which uh, goes hand in hand with the message of uh, 1888. Imputed righteousness, Jesus uh, vicariously dying for the whole earth that uh, man may be placed on probation to be uh, on the side of God. And then uh, uh, imparted righteousness is the, that sanctification that gives the power to be able to walk as even Christ uh, walked uh, when he was um, uh, on the face of the earth. And so this is the life eternal that they may know the, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom the, thou have sent. The people had to be pointed to Jesus Christ. And John continues in John 17. Look at what John says. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gaveth to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee from there before the world was. And then verse 6 says, I have manifested thy name unto thee men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest me, and they, they have kept thy word. And so there are issues that uh, we are dealing with in John chapter 17, verse 3. One of them being that I have finished the work. Now we are called Christians because we are Christ-like. And one of the reasons why Christ came into this earth is to finish the work. Hold on a minute. In the book of uh, Genesis chapter 2, the father finishes the work and rests. And then he sends his son on the earth and the son says that I have finished the work and he rests in the tomb and bursts forth on the third day having victory over sin. Now, if we are saying that uh, we are the children of God and Christ is our brother, we must be thinking of this issue of, I have finished the work. The third angel's message in verity finishes the work. And how does it finish the work? Another point is added by Jesus Christ uh, that um, I have glorified thee. Glorified thy son. I have glorified thee. Uh, and then he says that uh, I have manifested thy name. The children of God have to finish the work and they have to manifest the name. And no wonder in Revelation chapter 14 we are seeing the 144 standing on Mount Zion having the Father's name in their forehead. Christ finished uh, the work. He manifested the name of the Father. And the work of those living under the third angel's message is to finish up the work and manifest the name of the Father which means that uh, they have the righteousness of the Father uh, 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 in the end, manifesting the name of the Father and standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb. You see that uh, he overcame and is standing on Mount Zion, and those who overcome stands with him on uh, Mount um, Zion. Talking about uh, manifesting uh, the Father's name, it is coming into that position that you are thinking like the father himself and how is that made possible by um, uh, having the spirit of the son uh, in uh, our lives we are looking at 1888 it is diagnosis analysis and um, solution that the people had to be pointed to the divine person of jesus christ and uh, second peter i presume second peter chapter one look at this in this issue of knowing the true father and him whom he has sent and the message of righteousness by faith simon peter servant and an apostle of jesus christ to them that have obtained like precious faith so there is a faith so precious to be obtained with us and what is that faith the righteousness of god and our savior jesus christ read it again closely 
that uh, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our Jesus, our Lord. And so you see how the message of righteousness of God and our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, uh, uh, multiplies grace and peace in our life. And that peace is a peace that cometh from overcoming sin because a person who is falling is not multiplied with peace and with grace. You can only say that you are being multiplied with peace and grace if you are overcoming sin. But if you are not overcoming sin, you can't say that uh, you are uh, being multiplied with peace and grace. And so the message of righteousness of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, what it does, it brings peace and grace. And grace is that power that has been given unto us freely to be able to overcome sin. Looking, uh, 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 continuing look, to look at the history, we are told this. The Father giveth the Spirit to the Son. You notice that this is what uh, follows TM 92. Clear forth attributes and his relation to the Father was set forth before righteousness but by faith could be sounded. And uh, this is what the Lord is seeking to do in our life that uh, 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 let us just read uh, John, the book of John, John 3, 34. Uh, John chapter 3, verses 34. First of all, John starts saying he must increase, but I must de decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from above is above all. And uh, what he hath seen and heard, that he testify, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony has said to his seal that God is true. And then, for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. I, I want you to think about that. I want you to analyze that, what we are being spoken to on this message. That the one that God has sent speaketh the word of God, for God hath not given the Spirit by measure. So, because God sent his Son, he has given him the Spirit without measure. And uh, look again at the book of John. Um, the book of John, and uh, that is, um, it should be chapter 17. I'll just run through it uh, quickly. Uh, John chapter 20, not John chapter 17. Let not the thought escape you that him who the Father has sent, he giveth him spirit without measure. But now look at John chapter 20, 20 verse 21, because this issue of righteousness by faith is connected with the reception of the Holy Spirit without measure. Because that is what we understand the loud cry is. The, another angel coming from heaven with great power and the glory of God illuminating the whole earth. So this is the latter rain as we know it. And this is the impartation of the Holy Spirit in a manner that has never been before. John chapter 20 verse 21 says that then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you as my father has sent me, even so I send you. Think for that for, for a moment, look at um, the book of John 3.34. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. Now, if this is the situation with uh, Jesus Christ that he received the spirit without measure, and he says that the Father has sent him and given him the spirit without measure, and so he sends us, what we are expecting then is to receive the same spirit without measure to be the catalyst to the loud cry and proclaiming the third angel's message with power. And so how do we come into possession with uh, the spirit of God without measure? And uh, we are told that, uh, uh, and, and this is beautiful, you'll find that uh, it is uh, uh, beautiful, as uh, we read of, um, of it, this should be in the book of uh, Colossians chapter 3. 
I want to direct you to the book of Colossians chapter 3 where we find the issue of being filled with the Spirit without uh, measure. Look at this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonition, one another in psalms and in hymns, in spiritual song songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And so how big when the Spirit is come, he shall lead you in all truth, and this is the spirit in fullness, in its full measure, which the Lord giveth uh, uh, without uh, uh, measure. 1888, it is uh, diagnosis, analysis, and uh, solution. The Father is willing to give us his spirit without measure, if only we will receive his son. Notice also in her 1888 message what burden she had for missionaries. Quote, I feel my spirit stirred within me. I feel to the depth of my being that the truth must be born to other countries and nations and to all classes. Let the missionaries of the cross proclaim that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, who is Jesus Christ, the Son of the infinite God. This needs to be proclaimed throughout every church in our land. Christians need to know this and not to put man where God should be, that they may no longer be worshippers of idols, but of the living God. Idolatry exists in our churches, means had better be employed to save souls from death, which will be placing jewels in the crown of Jesus Christ and stars in our own crowns in the kingdom of God. Why is uh, the prophetess concerned with uh, people proclaiming God and Jesus Christ, God alone as the true God and Jesus Christ as the mediator of man, and not placing man where God should be? and practicing idolatry. It is because the third angel's message warns against the image of the beast and the seal of God. Either you have the seal of God or you have the mark of the beast. What is the mark of, be of the beast uh, as uh, we look at it uh, closely? It is placing man where God should be. In 1888 and prior to that, men had uh, accustomed themselves to looking at the uh, the pastors, the elders, and the conference leaders until Christ had been obscured and eclipsed from their lives and uh, he was no longer the mediator between man and God but men stood where Christ was. And so in the end time, the issues of the third angel's message is man standing between God and man. Instead of Christ being placed there, it is man who is placed there. And so there is no buying and selling unless you have the mark of the beast, unless you yield to the powers of man. And so God, the only true God, has to be lifted and Jesus Christ as the mediator between man and God so that um, uh, the, the, the image of the beast, the mark of the beast, may not be given to man. Uh, that is by putting man where uh, Christ should be. And this brings about the true message of atonement, that... Um, Whatever position the man holds in their lives, they cannot offer a sacrifice that can be accepted by God to be a propitiation for the iniquity of men. And so if any man will stand in the place of Christ being the mediator, whichever thing that is placed between man uh, uh, and God, which is not Jesus Christ, is idolatry. And so that is why any other doctrines that eclipse Christ as being the mediator of the covenant, being the atoning sacrifice, in whichever uh, uh, facet it may be, uh, will actually amount to idolatry, uh, according to the quote. And so righteousness by faith calls us to implicitly yield to God through Jesus Christ and no other person in between. Any other doctrines that comes there is actually a false um, uh, doctrine and it has to be rejected and so uh, the issue of uh, the one true God being revealed and one mediator being revealed to the people in 188 message was much important because we are having gods in our midst we are having other mediators in our midst and we have we are having scrupulous ways of men being put uh, between God and man instead of Jesus Christ being the center of uh, everything that is happening in heaven and uh, on earth. So though someone may say that the idolatry mentioned here is about people holding means wealth, which is true. There was more deeper revelation than that. The missionaries was to proclaim one God 
and his son, which is the message of the most holy place that reveals to the people that uh, there are only two on the throne and on those two hangs the salvation of uh, men. Uh, are acceptable spiritual sacrifices made to God when men who are placed in position of great responsibility magnify themselves and dishonor God? This has been done and God looks upon their cause with displeasure. Instead of growing up into Christ, their living head in all things, manifesting his divine attributes to the world, they have grown earthward. Self has been regarded as of great importance, and selfishness has attached itself to their work. Devotion to God has not been seen. Spiritual life in Jesus Christ has not been developed. This is the burden of the 1888 message, that uh, while people are thinking that they are doing a great work, uh, going here and going there proclaiming the message. In fact, if you look um, closely at the people who are rejecting the message of E.T. Jones and Wagon, and people like uh, uh, Elder Kilgo uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, Uriah Smith and uh, the president himself, uh, G.I. Butler, these were serious missionary workers. But uh, how comes that they rejected the message, or uh, they had a problem understanding the message of uh, Wagona and Et Jones. These people loved to be looked at rather than people looking unto Christ, and they could say, do this or do that, and if people did not work in that way, uh, those who are ministers, their salaries were withheld uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from the people. And so, uh, yes, Brother Zadok, you have something? And so this had taught men to look at them instead of looking unto Christ. You will read some uh, uh, quotes which say that uh, men who have been placed as conference leaders, they have uh, made themselves gods in that they will tell one do this and the other do that. And if they do not do that, their uh, salaries were withheld. And so men had placed themselves where God and Christ should be placed. And... Uh, as we are looking at uh, the diagnosis, analysis, and solution, you find that uh, the problem that uh, the people were facing in 1888 is the same thing that the people are facing in today's life. That uh, the people are told, do this and do that, and if they do not do that, their salaries are withheld as ministers. And uh, uh, people are trained to work in a certain way which is actually human devising rather than the devising of God uh, himself. And so people had lost devotion to God and their spiritual life in Christ had not been developed. Yet, you, you find Sister White saying that uh, it is a common belief that uh, the church is flourishing. It's a common belief that the church is uh, uh, flourishing, but this is uh, far from the truth that the church is uh, uh, flourishing, the church is retreating back to uh, what we call uh, 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 Babylon by looking unto man. Continued with this uh, history, and uh, uh, it is uh, diagnosis, analysis, and uh, solution. It is when you are looking to his throne, offering up your penitence and praise and thanksgiving to God that you perfect Christian character and represent Christ to the world. You abide in Christ, and Christ abides in you you have that peace that passes all understanding. We need constantly to meditate upon Christ and his attractive loveliness. We must direct minds to Jesus, fast them upon him, in every discourse dwell upon the divine attributes. And what are these divine attributes? They are revealed in the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, uh, 22. And that is what God is purposing that uh, we should be receiving as uh, his uh, people. And so, manuscript number 315, Righteousness by Five, Public Relations. I have heard the question asked, what do you think of this light that these men are presenting? Why I have been presenting it to you for the last 45 years, the matchless charms of Christ. This is what I have been trying to present before your minds, when Brother Wagner brought out these ideas in uh, Minneapolis, 
It was the first clear teaching on this subject from any human lips I had heard, excepting the conversations between myself and my husband. I have said to myself, it is because God has presented it to me in vision that I see it so clearly, and they cannot see it because they have never had it presented to them as I have. And when another presented it, every fiber of my heart said, Amen. And so this light was to present the matchless charms of uh, Jesus Christ, the love of Christ as a... Uh, a sweet oblation was to be mingled with his law and man had to uh, 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 to gaze at, upon the image of Christ that uh, he may reproduce the same image of Christ. And uh, this is uh, a principle that uh, uh, the Bible re-echoes every now and then. You can look uh, to that in uh, the book of Second Corinthians, the book of Second Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, it is verses, uh, uh, verses 17 and 18. This issue of intently gazing upon Christ and always beholding him. This is uh, what we read uh, in the book of uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now the Lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face beholding as in glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as this by the Spirit of um, uh, the Lord. And so, by continually looking at Jesus Christ, you start reflecting his image. But if men will teach men to look unto men, they will only manifest the image of the man they are looking unto. That is why in 1888 we had a lot of contention, we had a lot of debates, we had a lot of evil surmising, we had a lot of dissension, and we had a lot of indifference in those meetings because men had been taught to look to men and only what they could reproduce is the image of men instead of the image of Jesus Christ. That is also happening in the time that you are living in right now, that men have been taught to look at men and the only thing they can reproduce in their life is the image of God of man. But Second Corinthians tells us that as we behold Jesus Christ, as we behold God, we are ten, turned into the self-same image. And this is what we need to be hearing every now and then. Let me just say at this moment, why are our churches dying? And I'm not talking about even the GCSDA churches, which many people have left. Why are the churches of independent ministries and uh, uh, other uh, uh, movements, why are they dying? Why is there that there is no spiritual nourishment and there is no growing in Christ as they were before they came from the GC and nominal churches? It is because every time you go to church, you are hearing about this man and hearing about that man. You are hearing about who believes this and who believes that. There is no one who is talking about Jesus Christ and what he's doing in the heavenly sanctuary and people being directed to look at him intently and uh, behold his face so that they may be turned into his image. The moment we shall cease exalting this man and exalting that man and uh, talking on which side we lean upon and on which side we do not lean upon, we shall see a revival taking place. When Christ is talked of in the churches from morning to the evening, you shall be able to see a great revival that you have never seen because people will become acquainted with the closing of work of Jesus Christ in the most holy place and they will just want to look exactly like him. But uh, in as much as we continue talking about men and what men are doing and this and that, let us hope only to have the image of man and not the image of God. That, that may sound... Uh, 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 and not good to your ears, but that is the reality. And so, Sister White had been presenting this message for the last 45 years, and the people were not understanding it. Take 45 years from 1888, and you come unto 1843. From 1843, she has been presenting the righteousness of, by faith, but no one was understanding. But now, uh, we shall see that uh, when Wangona and Jonas uh, brought the message, it was clearly understood, and um, this man... Uh, how, how am I forgetting his name? When he went to Sister White and um, asked 
if uh, Wagona was able to present these points more clearer than uh, her uh, herself, she said, yes, Wagona has been given the gift by God to present these messages, not as uh, I could present it. And so uh, she continues to say, behold what uh, manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. It is one of Satan's devices that we should be picking up all these disagreeable things and that our mind should not be dwelling on God and his love. That is what Satan wants, that we should keep our minds occupied with these things of a revolting character that cannot bring peace, joy, and harmony into the life, nothing but discouragement, and that we should not represent Jesus Christ. And uh, let, us only sh let us try to shift gears and shift our thoughts from just blaming the leaders and blaming the people who are in charge and come to our personal lives. Have we accepted the devil to bring discouragement unto our lives until we cannot behold the image of Jesus Christ and be turned to his image, that uh, we are beholding troubles, talking about troubles, talking about our problem, talking about our spouses, talking about everything disagreeable until our mind has possessed that atmosphere of disagreeableness. And that is what we reflect because as you dwell on it so much, that is what your neurons, the parts of your brain develop. The same things that you will feed your neurons with, it is the same thing that uh, they will actually retribute. And uh, we understand even this in the anatomy and uh, uh, physiology, uh, that uh, as a child is growing, be it a uh, physical child growing up or a spiritual child growing up. The things that the neurons are fed upon because the neurons are like a blank paper and they are waiting for information to be imprinted on it. And as you continue feeding the neurons, so they write that message as if it were the ink on a paper. So imagine yourself in your house yourself, at your work, the only thing that you are coming in contact with writing on your neurons is disagreeable things. How will you expect to reflect the image of the lovely Jesus if all you are gathering around yourself every way is every day are these negativities? The righteousness of Jesus Christ that pertains to the third angel's message does not consist in collecting all disagreeableness and putting them on the plate. Because as you feed on them, so you shall reflect the same image. And that is what we are repeating both in the church and in our homes. People dwell on these things which are so negative that the same spirit that uh, is permeating their houses and their homes is the same spirit they bring into the churches. And so the church are, churches are continually dying because men are standing on the pulpit with the problem of their houses, with the problem of their offices, until the only thing they can preach when they are on the pulpit are disagreeable things instead of uh, preaching things that point on to Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, I think I'll attend to those messages on the board later. And so uh, if this is what is happening to our churches, brothers and sisters, that uh, our home life, our office work, is really affecting even how we present the messages to the people. Don't expect a revival to happen in those churches. What you shall see is a downfall every day, every day and every minute. And uh, the, 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 the position is that the church is growing. Hey, we are being persecuted. No, you are not being persecuted. The church is not growing. What is happening is that you are losing the image of Jesus Christ every day in those churches. And so... You know how it was with Moses. He felt that he must have an answer to his prayer. He realized the responsibility of leading the people out of Egypt, but he did not go and pick up everything objectionable and dwell on it. He knew they were a stiff naked people and said, Lord, I must have thy presence. And the Lord said, my presence shall go with you. You remember Moses went into the wilderness and stayed 40 years, during which time he put away self and that made room so that he, he could have the presence of God with him. Now, you know, 
as a people, we only talk about righteousness by faith and justification by faith on a, a surface value, thinking that we understand this verse and that quote. But it goes beyond looking unto the people and uh, bringing yourself in a position that, uh, yes, sin has to be re uh, uh, reproved, corrections have to be made, but every day gathering about this negativity, Moses says that, uh, I will not dwell on these things, I must have your presence. And then God says that my presence you shall have. I wonder how many people who are preaching righteousness by faith are, are, are saying like Moses, God, I must have your presence. And God has answered them, go, uh, you, my presence shall go with you. Moses does not say, you see God, these people have made idols. You see God, these people have rejected the health message. You see God, these this Israelites have gone with the Moabites and all this stuff. Moses says, you know, God, if you reject these people, the nations will hear about it. And they'll say he brought them out of Egypt and is able not to sustain them. And he has decided to do away with them in the wilderness. Now, God, if you are not going to go with us, then the first name you have to blot from your book is my own, my name. And then you can go ahead with the other Israelites. To find people who are to say such a words in the presence of God is a rare thing in this time. Yet, we want to be leaders to guide people to the promised land while we won't die to self and take a position that will be like the meekest man upon the face of the earth. This is a rebuke to me and this is a rebuke to you who are preaching the message of righteousness by faith, yet it has not been practically uh, being uh, seen in our lives. During the conference at Battle Creek, when the question of the law in Galatians was being examined, I was taken to a number of houses and heard the unchristian remarks and criticism made by the delegates. Then these words were have spoken. They must have the truth as it is in Jesus, else it will not be a saving truth to them. Without me, says Christ, he can do nothing. When, in, when finite men shall cease to put themselves in the way to hinder, then God will work in our midst as never uh, before. This is 1888. It is diagnosis, analysis, and the solution. The time has come when through God's messengers, the scroll is being unrolled to the world. Instructors in our school should never be bound about by being told that they are to teach only what has been taught hitherto. Away with these restrictions. There is a God to give the message his people shall speak. Let not any minister feel under bonds or be gorged by men's measurement. The gospel must be fulfilled in accordance with the messages God sends. That which God gives his servant to speak today will not perhaps have been present truth 20 years ago, but it is God's message for this time. As um, the latter rain is being poured unto the people, and it starts as the deal, uh, and then it comes into a morphing of uh, uh, the uh, abundant outpouring, we are told that uh, uh, more truth shall be given unto the people of God and uh, uh, Deuteronomy, uh, uh, I love this verse, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 1 to 4, which uh, we are familiar with. This is it, that uh, give ear, O ye heavens, and I'll speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall be still as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Because I'll publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are, jud are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. When you look at uh, the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32, what you are seeing is that uh, God will give information as due and then as the showers. So we are expecting the old truth to be shining with more light as we near the end of the time. And uh, as this truth comes as the word of God, as dew and as showers, we find that uh, what it will do away is to... It will do away with iniquity and help people to publish the name of the Lord. Now, what, is, what does it entail to publish the name of the Lord? I'll give you a verse in uh, Corinthians 
uh, let everyone that names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. That is Second uh, Timothy, not uh, Corinthians. Second Timothy chapter two, verses nineteen. I'll read it. What does it mean to publish the name of the Lord uh, as uh, as the dew and the showers of the latter rain? Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His, and what? And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now we are told in Deuteronomy that the the rain shall the words of the Lord shall uh, flow as the dew and as uh, the showers, and the name of the Lord shall be published, and the people shall uh, uh, depart from iniquity. And we are told that uh, this publishing of the name of the Lord, this publishing of the name of Christ, in it is real sense, it is departing from iniquity. And so as we behold the image of God and depart from iniquity, that will be the loud cry. I propose to you that. And uh, more light shall continue to shine upon uh, 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 our lives. Continued on, uh, when, uh, and uh, we are just coming to an end in a short while, when I have been made to pass over the history of the Jewish nation and have seen where they stumbled because they did not walk in the light, I have been led to realize where we are as a people will be led if we refuse the light God will give us. Eyes have ye, but you see not. Ears, but ye hear not. Now, brethren, light has come to us, and we want to be where we can grasp it. And God will lead us out one by one to him. You see what the Lord will do under the latter rain? It is to lead us out one by by one to him, not unto people, but unto him. And so we shall be spiritually united. And then when the spirit of the Lord is in you and the spirit of the Lord is in me, then we shall become one in Christ. I see you at danger and I want to warn you. Now this is the last minister's meeting we'll, we'll have unless you wish to meet together yourselves. If the ministers will not receive the light, I want to give the people a chance. Perhaps they may receive it. God did not raise me up to come across the plains to speak to you, and you sit here to question his message and question whether Sister White is the same as he used to be in years gone by. I have in many things gone way back and given you that which was given me in years past, because then you acknowledge that Sister White was right. But somehow it has changed now, and Sister White is different just like the Jewish nation. I want to point out, uh, as I close in this quote, that uh, one of the things that happened with the Israelites looking unto man and refusing the true messages of God was, uh, uh, one of the things they did was uh, to reject the prophet. That is, John the Baptist, and uh, slay him. And they ended up also... Uh, uh, allowing Jesus Christ to be crucified. They rejected the prophets. And uh, one of the things that you have to see at this time happening is the rejection of the truth as uh, has been revealed unto us by E.G. White. And as you see these things happening, you start understanding that uh, we are in the position of 1888 again. And uh, the Lord is seeking to do something to his church and we want to ask ourselves, will we be among those who shall be able to proclaim this message in its fullness? Or will be, we be on the side of those uh, who had a problem with it and uh, rejected it initially, although they later repented of it? But the message has never been proclaimed again in the Seventh-day Adventism, and the Lord is seeking to bring it back again. Or He is already uh, through various means and various ministers bringing it together. I want us to pause here as we go into a break and think about the things that uh, I have spoken about and uh, ask ourselves individually, are we aligning ourselves with God or are we aligning ourselves with the arch enemy of the everlasting gospel? May the Lord lead us and continue uh, 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 teaching us these things. Shall we uh, have a, a word uh, of uh, prayer? 
Our Father which art in heaven, thank you for the foundation that we are laying for the truth to be preached for such a time as this. I want just to ask you humbly that uh, you may speak to us individually and that uh, after we have made our act right, Lord, that we may be able to stand before the people. Thank you for your love and thank you for your mercies and thank you for everything you are doing in our life and restoring the truth in such a time as this when the world is in confusion. I pray that um, you may minister unto your children in a way that they have never been ministered unto as we go through this in Jesus' name. Amen.